Okay, here we go. What's the Torah portion today? This is a beautiful picture of the Sea of Galilee, in case you didn't know. And can you read Shabbat Shalom? Do you see the word? You have the shin for the S-H, the bait for the B, the top for the T, Shabbat. And you can see Shalom. Do you see the S-H-L-O-M? Shabbat Shalom. All right. Well, Monday is the grand opening celebration of Moses' tabernacle. Nisan 1. All right. And so this is what is being celebrated. Think about this next week, that this is what is going on here Aaron's sons uh, are being uh, anointed and consecrated. Now, what does Shemini mean? Eighth. So it was the eighth day. And you can see the Shin, S-H-M-I-N-I, Shemini. And that means the eighth day. But the eighth day was the first day of Nisan. Okay, so the week before, the seven days prior, they had to get ready, consecrated, stay in the presence of the Lord. And then on that eighth day of being consecrated, that was the first day of Nisan. Now in Exodus 40, 17 through 20, here it is. It came to pass in the first month. Now that's not January, right? That's Nisan. In the second year, all right? So what happened the first day of the first month in the first year? Does anyone can tell me what happened this is the first day of the first month in the second year. What happened on the first day of the first month in the first year? No, that's on the 14th. The first Exodus 12, God said to Moses, now look, this is to be the beginning of the months for you. Okay, I think it's Exodus 12, one through two. But God was telling Moses, look, and think about this, the first commandment ever given to Israel. Now, I'm not saying the number one commandment, which is to love the Lord your God, but it, it was, and I'm not saying the first commandment, which is only worship your God, or actually, I am the God who saved you. The first actual commandment given to Israel was get on my calendar. Exactly a year ago, from uh, this point in time, God said to Moses, okay, if if I'm the boss, I'm going to tell you what time we're going to meet, when we're going to meet, where we're going to meet. And if we're going to meet with God, we got to get on his calendar. And they were still in Egypt at this time. That's how important this was. It says the tabernacle was reared up. Moses reared up the tabernacle, laid the socket, set up the boards, put in the bars, reared up the pillars, and he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent above it as the Lord commanded Moses. So he didn't do it how he felt it would look good. He had to follow the plans. How many of us men like to follow instructions? Or do we just want to put it together and then have to take it apart when we uh, messed it up? So let's look at Leviticus 9, 3 and 4. And to the children of Israel, I want you to speak saying, now again, this is the first day. This is Nisan 1. This is happening. Take a kid of the goats for a sin offering a calf and a lamb, both of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, a bull and a ram for a peace offering to sacrifice before the Lord and a meat offering mingled with oil for today the Lord will appear to you. So we see there was all types of offerings for all different types of reasons. But what would you think if all of a sudden the Lord says, today I'm gonna to appear to you? I better be ready. <laughs> Verse six. <clears throat> So Moses says, this is what the Lord commanded <clears throat> that you shall do, and the glory of the Lord is going to appear to you. Let's look at Exodus 40, because all this is the same day. What I'm, all these verses are tying in the very same moment. Exodus 40, verse 34 says, the cloud covered the tent of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So I'm just trying to show you how these connect. So then we jump back to Leviticus 9, 22 through 24. <clears throat> okay, uh, yeah. Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and he blessed them. He's saying the priestly blessing from number six. He came down 
<clears throat> from the offering of the sin offering and the burn offerings and the peace offerings. But guess what? The fire never fell yet. The fire didn't fall. Why? Because Moses and Aaron worked in unity over the sin of the golden calf. So look what happens. Moses and Aaron both had to go into the tabernacle in front of God and get things right. And then they came out and they blessed the people. And then the glory of the Lord appeared to everybody. So here we have to get our human relations right before the Lord, before the Lord will appear. That's why it always says, go in the gospels. It mentions, you know, go get it right with your brother or sister and then go offer your offering. So what do we see then? There came a fire out from before the Lord and it consumed on the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they screamed and fell on their faces. Wow. That's why they were not to let the fire go out. It wasn't a man-made fire started with matches. It was a fire from heaven. And ha God is not interested in our fire. <clears throat> so now the tour portion uh, begins... And I want to show you here, now this is a different year, so it's falling on a different day, but <clears throat> there is the, the first of Nisan, and, but it started, like I said, a week before, and then here they are doing the offerings, and then the fire falls from heaven. But guess what else happens? His two sons offered strange fire. And they got killed. Don't you think that put a little dampening of the spirit on that day for Aaron? Oh my gosh, here's the grand opening ceremony. And, and it's like God didn't say, oh, okay, I want it to go good, so I'm not going to do it. No, he lost his two sons on that very day. <clears throat> it says it came to pass, again, Leviticus 9, 1 and 2, the verses just before 3 and 4 we led, read earlier. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons, the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, take the calf for a sin offering, a ram for the burnt offering without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. Okay, <clears throat> I think it's interesting that the eighth day, when you think of a week, seven days long, the eighth day is also the first day. Well, <clears throat> just as 7,000 years was allotted to humanity... After the millennial reign, we have the eighth day or the first of the whole for eternity. Okay, we have a new heaven and a new earth. This is why circumcision is always on the eighth day. It's the cutting of off all flesh, the old earth, the old heavens. <clears throat> and this is why the glory fell on the eighth day. And in the eighth millennium, after the millennial reign, that's when the glory is going to fall big time, new heavens, new earth. And Israel, in one sense, was spiritually circumcised, entering into a new relationship and a covenant with the Creator. But as I said, look at Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, <clears throat> took either of them his censer and put fire and put on incense, and they offered strange fire before the Lord, which he did not command them. And they went out of fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Some people, they try to imagine why. I mean, everyone tries to study why. And uh, there's different reasons. They all could be valid reasons. One of them, it was strange fire. They lit their own man-made fire. They did take incense off the coals of the altar. They offered this. That's what it basically says. <clears throat> the other thing is, uh, they said they were drinking a little too much wine <laughs> before they did that. Uh, and this is why the priests were commanded not to do that, which you're going to see here in just a minute, when they're uh, doing that. So look at Leviticus 10.3. Then Moses said to Aaron, I mean, how many of you don't like your little brothers and sisters or big brothers and sisters reprimanding you? Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't work sometimes. But here... Your sons just died, and Moses is smacking Aaron after his sons just died. He, he goes, this is what the Lord said. I'm going to be sanctified in them that come near to me, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron just held his peace. Well, the thing is this. God 
has to keep a separation between himself and us for our protection. It's for our protection. A human ruler is feared more by his slave than he is by those who are close. Just like the president has all these close people to him, and they know him, and so they're not quite as afraid as someone who doesn't know him, but he's the boss. You know what I'm talking about? In any relationship, you always have the, the, the main team, and then you have the people that don't know, uh, and so they have hold the other person more in reverence or fear, however you want to look at it. Well, a human, uh, let me see, it is stated that Look what the Lord says. The Lord says it's just the opposite. The ones who are closest to me better fear the most. Because you're playing with fire. It's just the opposite with the Lord. Usually those who are far away and don't really know the person, you have a human ruler, they fear them, but the inner circle don't. But here God says the inner circle better fear me a whole lot more than the ones that are out there because you're more accountable. In Amos 3, 1 and 2, Look at this. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, children of Israel, and against the whole family which I brought out of the land of Egypt, saying, Look, you only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, you get a special spanking. I'm going to punish you for your sins. Wow. It's those who are closest to him, the children of Israel, that are going to be punished. The king punishes his, the father punishes his own kids. And so we have to realize if we're his kids, that doesn't mean we'll never get spanked and we can disobey and destroy the house and all of that. <laughs> no, dad doesn't punish the neighbor kid. He punishes you. <laughs> and so we have to understand this principle. Those who are closest to God better hold him in more reverence. He doesn't expect the neighbor kid to hold him in reverence. You understand the opposite of this. Okay. Now, look at Leviticus 10, 8 through 11. So the Lord, now he's speaking to Aaron after his sons die. And he says, don't drink wine or strong drink. And this is why they think maybe they had too much to drink when they went to do the office of the priesthood. He says, nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. It'll be a statute forever throughout your generations so that you may put a difference between what is holy and what is what? Okay, can you see the difference between holy and common? And then look at the next phrase. And between what is unclean and what is clean. Do you see there's a difference between common and unclean? Common is bad and unclean is bad. But what is the difference? We're going to talk about that the second half. And it's so that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. So here we see in this incident a difference between holy fire and common fire brought in common wine, got drunk, no respect for authority. And basically they weren't to come in common clothes. And how many of you know you're not to play with electricity? Look at Leviticus 10. 12 and 13. So now Moses speaks to Aaron and to the two sons left, Eliezer and Edomar. And they said, he said, take the meat offering that remains of the offerings of the Lord made by fire and you have to eat it without leaven beside the altar for it is most holy and you have to eat it in the holy place because it is your due and your sons due the sacrifices of the Lord made by fire for so I am commanded. So Moses is upset. He's the uncle of these two kids that die, but he also wants to follow the rules. And sometimes we want to follow the rules, we forget about the relationships. And that, I mean, that's what a lot of legalism is all about. But he says, look, I, in other words, I think Moses is thinking, I don't want anyone else to die. So let's do this right. But how many you know Aaron wasn't too pleased? But look at last week, Leviticus 6, 24 through 26. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell Aaron and his sons, this is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, the sin offering is killed before the Lord and it is what? And that's what Moses just told him. The priest who offers it for sin has to do what? 
eat it. They have to eat it in the holy place in the court of the tent of meeting. But guess what happened? I don't know if Nadab and Abihu were the ones attending to the fire that day, but after all of this is going on, it gets burnt to crispy critters. No one's attending to it. And now that it's burnt to crispy critters, his two brothers have to eat it anyway. Now, how many of you like a, a, a nice steak cooked like you want? And how many of you want a nice steak that is burnt to a crisp? Let's watch what, <laughs> you're so funny. I like my steaks well done. Okay. But look at what happens. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 16 through 18, Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering. Where did that goat go that was cooked? And behold, it was what? Burnt. And then he was angry with Eliezer and Itamar, the sons of Aaron, which were left alive. And he says, why have you not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, seeing it is most holy? God has given it to you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, the blood of it. You didn't even bring it in the holy place. There's no blood left. It's all burnt. You should indeed have eaten it in the holy place as I commanded. Wow. Moses, my brothers just died, two of them. We have other things on our mind right now. Can you sense the turmoil, the conflict? And this is supposed to be the grand opening ceremony, for heaven's sake. Now, I want to point out something that I believe is truly amazing. See, uh, I don't have our Torah school here. In every Torah scroll, there are 304,805 Hebrew letters, in case you didn't know. There are 79,847 Hebrew words. Well, the very middle is Leviticus 10, 16, which is the very verse that says Moses diligently sought. Now, in Hebrew, we say very diligently or something like that, or diligently sought. But in Hebrew, they say the word twice. It would be translated more correctly as Moses sought, sought. That means he's definitely looking for it, right? Okay, well, it just so happens to see this little asterisk there. That is the very heart of the Torah. And the words you can see there, you, uh, right on the other side of the heart, and right after the heart is the same word. Do you see that? The Dalet Reshin. And it is, but it's pronounced a little bit differently. It is Darosh Darosh. And that means search, search. So if you think of it as in the middle of the Torah, the whole Torah pointing to the center from both sides. Well, another word for search, search is study. Study. So you could go from the center going out each way, and it means to seek. Well, guess what? 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God at workmen that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, when you rightly divide the Torah, this is the verse you come to. So the Hebrew word derash means to search or to study. And it's right in the heart of the Torah are the words, search, search, study, study. And what are we supposed to be searching for and studying? The goat of the sin offering. Who is Yeshua? That's what everything is pointing to. Look at John 5, 39. Search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. And when you search and study, he is the goat of the sin offering. We find the Messiah. So throwing out the Torah eliminates how it witnesses about Yeshua because it all points to him. Now look at Leviticus 11, 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, and he said to them, tell the children of Israel, these are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Well, you know what's interesting is that brings us right back again to the Garden of Eden. Why do I say that? 
God pointed out, first command, what you can eat and what you can't eat. Isn't that fascinating? The whole presence of God was in the Garden of Eden. Now we're trying to get God to come back into the tabernacle, his presence back on earth. And he begins with the first thing, be careful what you put in your mouth. And that was to, you know, all of humanity back in the Garden of Eden. But I want to go over this. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 through 12. There's a purpose for everything under heaven, it says in Ecclesiastes, right? Look here. Because it is God's purpose that our way of life may be not unclean, but holy. So what does God want our way of, and he is the way, Yeshua is the way. And the way of life is to be what? Not unclean, but holy. It says, whoever then goes against this word, goes against not man, but God, who is giving his Holy Spirit to you. So do we want to be unclean or do we want to be holy? Well, let's look at Genesis 1, 28 and 29. It says, God blessed them. And he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish, over the birds, over every living thing that moves on the earth. They're to have dominion. Dominion doesn't mean kill. Okay? Parents have dominion over their children. But that means to care for. But then look at what it says. God said, behold, I've given you every herb yielding seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree which bears fruit yielding seed, it will be your food. Do you realize what God's commanded them? To be vegetarians. God commanded them to be vegetarians. Now, before the flood, mankind realized they were dependent on the vegetation of the land, which means they were dependent on the rain and God's blessing. God had to cooperate with man, bringing the sun, bringing the rain for their food. Man was given dominion and mastery over the animal world, but that didn't mean we could eat them. How many of you love chicken? Okay. Well, if you love chicken, why do you eat it? Why, why don't you protect it? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Oh, oh I love steak. Well, then why do you kill the cow? <laughs> why do, if you love something, that doesn't mean you're to consume it. So often in all of our relationships, if we love someone, we want to consume them. Are you following me? This, this is what is embedded in all of our minds. Okay. God is still in authority. They were commanded to be vegetarians. So the whole purpose of commanding them what they can eat and what they cannot eat means God says, I am the boss in this world. Just like your children in their room. It's their room, but it's your room before it's their room. All right? And, and look at this. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. God commanded the man. Of, now, how many of you just read that? God commanded who? Eve wasn't even created when this commandment was given. She had no idea. It says, God commanded uh, the man of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. For in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. So that means even fruit was separated. The fruit of the tree of life was separated from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this is the problem. People are always choosing, well, I want to know what's good and what's evil. They're on the same tree. Forget about dividing between good and evil. The question is death or life. The problem is we're so concerned with getting good, but that's on the tree that kills you. You have to look at it. It's, it's, it's not good nor evil. Is it life or death? That is the weightier matters of the law. Genesis 7, 2. Look at this. You shall take seven pairs of every clean animal with you, male and his female, and the animals that are not clean take two, the male and his female. Do you know what that meant? No one knew the difference between clean and unclean. Even though he was a vegetarian, when he sacrificed animals to the Lord, and he did, he built an altar as well, he knew the difference between clean food and unclean food. Why? Because God doesn't want unclean food offered even before Moses' tabernacle. 
when Cain and Abel did their offering. Now, there's nothing wrong with Abel or Cain's offering because it was grain and that's acceptable. All right. But you have to understand from the very beginning, they knew the difference between clean and unclean animals because they did sacrifices and God didn't want unclean animals. Uh, now, look at what happens in Genesis 9, 1 through 3. I got to hurry. Oh my gosh. Okay. Genesis 9, 1 through 3. Here we see God blesses Noah and he says, be fruitful, multiply, and the fear of you and the dread of you will be on every beast of the earth. Why? Because now they can eat them. And then it says, and on every fowl of the air, everything that moves on the earth, all the fishes of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Why? Look at this. Every single thing that moves will be food for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. There's a new permission. Uh, Noah can now eat unclean foods. He says, you can eat meat now. You can eat fish. You can eat birds. And I don't care what you eat. If it moves, you can eat it. There was no separation. There still was a separation of what could be sacrificed, but there was no separation whether they could eat clean or unclean food. And then look at chapter 9, verse 4 through 6. Then it says, but the flesh with its life, its blood, don't eat it. In other words, don't start chewing on something that's still alive. And he says, uh, then he says, that surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it and at the hand of man, even at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood will be shed because he was made in the image of God. Okay, so after the flood, God did not want to destroy the earth again. And so he gave Noah a few more laws than he gave Adam. These laws stand as the need for the rule of law to protect all people from the lawless violence that brought God to the point of destroying the whole world to begin with. Those who are opposed to God's laws are of an antichrist spirit being lawless and they're being deceived. We know we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. But now comes more expansive laws for God's people who are now to be holy and not common. And we find in Deuteronomy 14, 21, he says, as for you guys, my kids, I don't want you to eat anything that has already died. Something is old and it's dead, even if it's kosher, even if it is a cow. If it died on its own and has been dead for several days, I don't want you eating that. There's a Hebrew word for that I will share with you. But look what he does uh, say. It says, give it to the stranger that is in your gates that he can eat of it or sell it to an alien, but you are holy. So it's not like, I mean, you can't get on other people's cases about whether they eat it or not because God's given it to other people. Okay? Now, look at this, Leviticus 11, 39 and 40. If any animal of which you may eat, do you see that? Whoever... So this is an animal that's kosher. Whoever touches it becomes unclean until the evening. Whoever eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. He also who carries its carcass shall wash his clothes and be clean unto the evening. Do you realize that eating clean animals can make you unclean? Whoever does the hunting and catches it and picks it up, he's now unclean. And when mom cooks it, she now becomes unclean until the eve, even though it's clean food because it's been killed. So how many of you know unclean food cannot be cleansed, but unclean people can be? All right. Now that's important to understand. Look at Leviticus 11, 46 through 47. It says this is, oh, I skipped 44 and 45. Okay. He says, for I am the Lord your God. You will therefore sanctify yourselves and I want you to be holy because I'm holy. So don't defile yourselves with any manner of creepy crawlers that creep on the earth. For I'm the Lord that brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. And the New Testament quotes that verse. Leviticus 11, 46 and 47 goes on. This is the law of the beasts, the fowls, every living creature that moves in the water, every creature that creeps on earth. And the whole purpose is to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the beast that can be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. Now, here's the thing. Eating animals that are the prey rather than the predator. 
Really, when you think about it, a lamb is not a predator. Anything that is a predator, you're not to eat because you become a predator. You following me? You are what you eat. That's the purpose of the clean and unclean. So we become not wolves, but lambs. This teaches us that we're not to be among others uh, who are pursuing people. You are what you eat. And we know uh, the fruit. We'll know people by their fruit. Leviticus 13, 45. Look at this. The leper in whom the plague is has to wear torn clothes and the hair of his head is hanging loose and he has to cover his upper lip and cry, unclean, unclean. Does he do that so no one will eat him? (laughs) What? There's a difference between unclean people and unclean food. Does everyone see that? Okay. So he's not yelling, unclean, please don't eat me. They weren't cannibals. Okay. Now look at Acts 10, 7. An angel spoke to Cornelius, and he called two of his household servants, a devout soldier. Of them, eh, they waited on him continually. And now look at Acts 10, 9 through 16. On the morrow, they went on their journey, drew nigh to the city. Peter was up on his housetop to pray about the sixth hour. That's lunchtime. And he became very hungry. He would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a vessel descend to him. And as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts, wild beasts, creepy crawlers, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, No way, Lord. I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Okay, what's the difference between common and unclean? I will tell you the second half. Okay, <clears throat> The voice spoke to him a second time. What God has cleansed, don't call what? Common, not unclean, common. And this was done how many times? Why? Because there were three people, three people from the other nations who are considered unclean. That's why. Look at Acts 10, 19. Peter thought in the vision and the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. And then in Acts 10, 28, he said to them, you know how that is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come to one of another another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. It did not say I can now eat unclean food. Shock and awe. We're going to finish with a couple of pictures here. Here we see (coughs) a chicken is kosher. But a dead chicken, if it's killed in a non-kosher way, it's no longer edible. (coughs) Excuse me. Here we have three people that are unclean coming to meet Peter. And that's why this happens three times. Then he has this creepy crawler vision of all these things descending to him. And it happens three times. And that's why three men came to see him. I'm going to, oh, let me, I'm going to, well, let me show you this. So here is that verse. It says, but Peter said, not so, Lord, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. I'm going to show you this, and I'll bring it up again. Unclean at the top right, red underneath it, in uh, Greek, you see, it is akatharton. You see the Greek and then the transliteration in red, okay? And then in the blue, the word common in the Greek is koine. You heard of koine Greek? That means the common Greek, not the classical Greek. And so I have common and then koine, and well, it says koinon. And then there's another word, though, I want to show you that it actually In the Greek and in the Hebrew, it doesn't say common or unclean. It has three different things, okay? The green is ephagon, and it means pegul in the Hebrew. And so look at the Hebrew transliteration at the very bottom, volumer, kipha. Uh, You know, the Lord told me, don't eat anything that is pegul or shekets tame. So there's three Hebrew words here. And so we have to understand those. We're going to look at those. 
And then God now says what God has cleansed don't call common. And so you see common and the Greek word koine and koine, but in Hebrew, it's shakets. You see the word shakets on the bottom? So we're going to go over all of these when we come back. But here's the thing. Unclean people can become clean people. Clean. Here's a clean, unclean person. This kid is clean, but he's unclean because he's by your grave. You following me? These kids who are in the mud are clean, but they're dirty. But that's completely different. Clean and unclean animal and a clean and unclean person. This is important because we're not to eat unclean people. No, but unclean animals, we can't eat. You don't clean unclean animals. So lastly, here we have the word koine and the word akathartos, which means common and unclean. Okay, do not call people common or unclean is what the Lord told Peter. So let's stand. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay, now we're going to dig deeper into the New Testament. Are you ready? I'm going to try to go slow. I will try. And because uh, I really want you guys to get this. They always say there's two kinds of teachers. One that just wants to get something out and one that wants to get something in. I want to get this in. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to go back to Acts 10, 28, where we closed... Okay, so here we are, and again, I want you to notice, it says common or unclean, and I have the words for common and unclean, but there is an extra word in there. You'll notice on the blue, number 14 in Hebrew, there's this word called pigul, sheketz tamei. What in the world is going on here? This is why you have to have accurate translations. And then, so it's Shaquettes and Tamei, but now there's this Pagool. So here you go. You can take a picture of this or write this down. In English, the word common food, in Greek it's koine, but in Hebrew it's Shaquettes. All right? And Shaquettes really means an abomination, not common, but an abomination. I will, uh, I think I have an extra verse on your, uh, that I've added, you could just reference. In Leviticus 11, verse 11 and 12, here's what it says. God is telling them what they can eat and not eat. And he says, all that don't have fins and scales that is in the water, the rivers, everything that moves in the water, and of any, any living thing which is in the waters, they are to be an abomination. Well, the word abomination in Hebrew is shekets. So that word in Hebrew, shekets, rather than anything else, it should be translated as in English as an abomination. Okay, and right here is the proof. It goes on and says, they will even be an abomination or shekets to you. You will not eat their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses as an abomination. Whatever has no fins or scales in the water shall be an abomination. And every time it says abomination in that verse, it's the word shekets. All right, so you have to understand that common actually means something that is disgusting. Okay. Now, unclean means akathartos in the Greek, and in Hebrew it's tame, and that refers to the Leviticus unclean foods, not unclean people. Unclean foods, well, unclean people can be tame too, but you can't eat people. Now, when you see the word English, the word is unclean. In Greek, it is akathartos. And in Hebrew, it is 
tame. Now, what is that word pegul? Means kosher food that no longer can be eaten because maybe it was killed improperly or maybe it's been lying dead of itself for 10 days or even two days. God said, if you remember, any kosher food that dies of itself is pegul. So the difference between pegul and shekets, shekets is something that's abominable, but pegul is food that is kosher, but it's like the peace offering. You have to eat it within three days. Otherwise, you're cut off if you eat it afterwards. So does everyone understand the difference between pegul, tame, and shekets? Okay. What is the Greek word for common? The Greek word for common. Koine. And what is the Hebrew word for common? Shekets, which basically means an abomination. Okay, and what is the Greek word for something that's unclean? Akathartos, and in Hebrew it is, and that refers to the animal specifically mentioned in Leviticus. And if something is kosher, but it's no longer kosher, it is called pegul. Okay. Let me just see what I got here. Okay. Here we go. Are you ready to buckle up? I want to show you something now. We're now going to go to that same story, and I want you to see something. Here in Acts 10, 28, how many believe Peter should interpret the whole situation? He's the one who had the vision. He's the one that gives the interpretation. And Peter says to them, you know how it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now, when he says that, being unlawful, that is not unlawful in the Torah. It is unlawful by Jewish tradition. Okay? That just means they don't want anything to do with these abominable people. That isn't in the Torah. Peter just says that from the point of view of Jewish tradition. And then he says, they're not to even come near unto one of another nation. But we also know that Jews from every nation were there for Shavuot. So they weren't talking about Jews from another nation. They're talking about non-Jews. But look what the answer to the whole vision is. But God has shown me that I should not call any person an abomination or unclean. Now, again, that doesn't refer that we can now eat people. You follow me? There's a difference between food and people. But the whole vision, God, it doesn't say God has shown me I can now eat unclean foods. It doesn't say I can now eat unclean foods. What it says is God told me I'm not supposed to call Gentiles an abomination or unclean. That's the answer to it. Now, let's go look at that verse in the Greek, and you can see it says koine or akathartan. Do you see that? That's an ab abomination or unclean. Then we go down to the Hebrew, and we see a mistake. Why? Because the Hebrew isn't the original Hebrew. This is Dietlich taking the Greek and copying afterwards, reinterpreting the Greek rather than going to what it should originally say. So this Hebrew is something that was done in the 1800s. And if you'll notice, it says shekets or tame, which would agree with the English, but it is wrong. It should be koine or akathartan. Now, let me show you why this makes a big difference. Here is Romans 14. And look at Romans 14. He says, I am persuaded by the Lord that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to them it is unclean. What's the Greek word for unclean? Akathartos. What's the Hebrew word for unclean? Tommy. So that's what we should see in the Greek, right? It's koine, koine, koine. The English 
is intentionally mistranslated. It's supposed to say there is nothing common of itself, but to him who esteems it common, to him it is common. So this is not saying you can now eat unclean food. Now, how do you think it would be in the Hebrew? But look at this. It has, and let me bring this, shekets, shekets, shekets everywhere. All right. And so it says here to anyone who considers something to be uh, is not, uh, you know, here you have that word unclean, which is supposed to be tame, but it's supposed to be shekets. And that's what we have to uh, realize. It's not the word unclean as far as the Hebrew word being tame, and it's shekets, which means an abomination. So we have to understand Romans 14, 14, it's not saying you can now eat unclean food. It is saying uh, something completely different. So let's go on now to Luke 11, verse 37 through 39. Here it says, now while he was talking, there was a Pharisee who made a request that he would come and eat with him. And when Yeshua went in and took a seat at the meal, and when the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised because he came to the meal without first washing himself. Now, it's one thing to wash your hands before dinner, but it's like they're supposed to wash themselves before they eat. And look what it says. And the Lord said to him, you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the plate clean, but inside you are thieves and full of evil. Wow. Look at Matthew 23, 27, and 28. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you are outwardly appear righteous to people, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So here you have these sepulchers, all right? This is the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. But uh, back in the day, they would put uh, a whitewash over all the tombs so they'd look pretty. They'd all stand out in white so you don't accidentally walk over a grave and become unclean. But here, here you have these whited sepulchers. Well, what's in them? They look clean on the outside, but it's unclean bodies are in the inside. And here you have this nice cup that's all clean, but inside it is absolutely filthy. So what is God trying to say here? Well, let's look at Matthew 23, 27 and 8. Here's where he says, you're like whited sepulchers, but you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And then look at Malachi 2, 17. It says, you've wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, well, how have we wearied God? When you say everyone that does evil is actually good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them doing evil. What's happening today? Evil is called good. Good is called evil. And that's where we are today. Look at Isaiah 1, 16 through 20. It talks about washing yourself, make yourself clean. And how do you do that? By washing the inside. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Stop doing evil learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Though they as red as crimson, they will be as wool. But look at the key. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured with the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So we need to see what God wants us to be cleansed. It's from the inside. Kids can play in the mud, but they can still be clean, all right? Now, the other thing is, he's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. I have to mention, there are seven different types of Pharisees, like seven denominations within the Pharisees group. So the first one is called the shoulder Pharisee, and he's the one that's always looking over his shoulder to make sure someone is watching him do his good deeds. How I'm doing this good deed. Is anybody watching me do this good deed? He's more interested in public opinion. Then there's the Pharisee who announces, oh, will you you please wait for me? I have to go perform a good deed. This is a, I mean, look at their heart attitude. Oh, they they want to be impressing people with all the good deeds that they're doing. Then there's the blind Pharisee. 
And the blind Pharisee is the one who squints his eyes and bumps into walls until his head bleeds, refusing to look at a woman. Then there's the Pharisee who says, oh, tell me what I've done wrong so I can compensate for it with a good deed. Then there's the Pharisee who's constantly asking, well, what's my duty now? There's the Pharisee who serves God out of fear and the Pharisee who serves God out of love. I mean, so that's a good Pharisee. There are good Pharisees. And there are, but guess what? There's good Christians and bad Christians too. You know, they just serve God because they want to get to know people in the church so they can sell more Amway or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I'm, just, I'm telling you, there's a lot of people who appear religious outside because they want to take advantage of you, not because they care for God. Now, as a matter of fact, look at John chapter 3, 1 through 5. There were among the Pharisees a man named Nicodemus. He was one of the rulers of the Jews. And we know he was a little bit better Pharisee of all the different types of Pharisees. He came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, we are certain that you have come from God as what? There's a teacher who's come from God. And he says, because no one would be able to do what you do if God wasn't with him. But look what the Lord said to him. Truly, I tell you, without a new birth, no man is able to sing the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how is it possible for a man to give birth, be given birth when he's already old? Is he able to go into his mother's body a second time and come to birth again? And Jesus said in answer, truly I say to you, if a man's birth is not from water and from the spirit, it's not possible for him to go into the kingdom of God. Okay, people don't realize the Jews taught you had to be born again for a thousand years before Messiah came. Everyone thinks the concept of being born again was new right then at that moment. It had been going on for 1,500 years. Do you know what that term born again meant to the Jew? Does anybody know what that term meant? It, it meant a Gentile becoming a Jew. They became born again. And so Nicodemus says, I'm already a Jew. How can I be reborn as a Jew? That's what is being said here. Because they always thought Gentiles were born again when they became Jewish. He's already Jewish. How does he become Jewish again? So that was the situation that was going on back then. And that's why Messiah said, look, you have to be born not only of water from the womb, but you have to be born from the Spirit of God from up above. And that's why it doesn't matter what tribe you're from. Okay, let's look now at Isaiah 30:20 in regard to what he said. It says, though the Lord will give you the bread of trouble and the water of grief, you will no longer put your teacher on one side, but you're going to see your teacher. Nicodemus even called him the good teacher. Now look at Mark 10, 21 through 27. This is the rich young ruler. And it says, Jesus beholding him, loved him. And he said, one thing you lack, go your way, sell what you have, give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Take up your cross and follow me. And he was sad at that and he went away grieved because he had lots of stuff. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished as his words. Why was he astonished? Because if you're rich, that means you've been blessed by God. So how can you not enter the kingdom of heaven? They saw being wealthy as being blessed Therefore, what do you mean the rich can't enter? They're the ones who are the first to enter because they've been so blessed. But Yeshua says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were all astonished saying, who then can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them with men, it's impossible, but not with God, for with God, all things are possible. Well, look what Proverbs 3, 33 through 34 says. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Surely he scores the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. All right. Well, let me tell you something. Here you see, who understands the concept of a camel going through the eye of a needle? We know that's absurd, right? So what that was a Hebrew idiom that had already been around 
for a long time. In Jewish literature, they had said, who can make an elephant cross through the eye of a needle? All right. Well, the problem is there was the Babylonian Talmud, and in Babylon, they had elephants. And in the Jerusalem Talmud, Jerusalem, they had camels. So it's the same concept, but depending on whether it was Babylon, they would use the animal that fit the concept. So it wasn't a camel or an elephant going through a needle, which represented it was impossible, but both of those were used. So here's what this really is about. In this case, the illustration concerns it was a dispute between two rabbis. That's what this, and Yeshua quoted a lot of the Midrash because he wanted to relate to them. And they were talking about what is impossible. Well, the camel was the largest animal seen regularly in Israel, whereas in regions where the Babylonian Talmud was written, the elephant was the biggest animal. And the whole concept was this. I thought I, oh, I've never did do that. Doggone it. Okay, this will make sense. They said, a needle's eye could never be too narrow for two friends. But the world isn't wide enough for two enemies. You following me? They're saying two friends can fit together in the smallest of places because they love each other. But two enemies, the whole world isn't big enough for them. Look at why all of the nations want to destroy Israel. The world isn't big enough to have a Jew in the world. So you understand that concept. Now, there, I didn't have enough time to get all of my PowerPoints done, but you're gonna understand this. There is the Kuf and the Resh. The last letters of the alphabet, Kuf, Resh, Shin, Tov. The Resh is next to the Kuf. And the Kuf stands for the word Kadim dosh, which means what? Holy. And the race stands for the word raw, which means evil. So evil is right next to holiness. You following me? And what they say is the purpose of uh, Jewish morals. It is said that the kuf has a little opening in it in order that should the Raish repent, he can still enter into God's holiness through the small opening. But they're right next to each other. Um, oh, here's another one. It says, the Holy One said, you open for me a door as big as a needle's eye, and I will open for you a door through which may enter camels. You follow me? So this is why they had the whole idea of the camel. God is saying, if you repent just a little bit, man, I'll make a ship be able to pass through this. This is like the story of the prodigal son. Okay? If he just returns, even a slight return, God is going to react and make you an opening that is you and a semi can go through it. Now I'm going to tell you a true story. We're going to close with this story, which is one of my favorite stories. This is a true story, and it happened in Krakow, Poland, okay? This is the concept of the rich man versus the poor man, but oftentimes we judge people. We look at them, they're rich, why aren't they giving, you know? I mean, if you look at a lot of the wealthy people in the world, even the wealthy politicians, they don't tithe at all. But then you take the poor person, they tithe of their welfare check. I mean, it's just amazing. So you can't judge people whether they're rich or they are poor. And this story demonstrates that. Now, let me just say this. In Poland, rather than a dollar, they have what's called a golden. Okay? It's not the dollar. It's the golden. And this is a story, I believe, that was in like the 1600s. In the city of Krakow, Poland, true story, there lived a very rich Jew, and his name happened to be Israel. But he was known by everyone because of how stingy he was. The local beggars had even given up trying to knock at his door. 
all attempts by the trustees of the community's various charities for even a token contribution from him were met with a very polite, but he's not given a golden. His utter heartlessness outraged and mystified the Jews of Krakow. In the 17th century Europe, where Jews were subject to frequent confiscations of their property, expulsions from their homes, it was essential for the community survival that those of means would aid their impoverished fellows. So people started referring to the rich miser in their midst as Israel the Goy. Goy means Gentile. Years passed, years. And the rich man grew old and frail. And one day the Krakow Burial Society received a summons by him to come to his house. And he says, I feel my days are numbered. He told them when they came. He says, I would like to discuss with you my burial arrangements. I've even had to hire someone just to recite the Kaddish for my soul. And there's just one thing remaining. I now need to purchase a burial plot for my grave. Well, the members of the burial society decided, hey, this was their opportunity to collect the massive debt they believe he owed to the community. And so they said to him, as you know, there is no set price for a cemetery plot. Every Jew pays according to their ability and the money is used for charitable purposes. Since you're a wealthy man, and if you will excuse our bluntness, you haven't been very forthcoming over the years in sharing the burdens of the community, we think it appropriate to charge you 1,000 goldens. Well, the rich man calmly replied, well, for my deeds, I will be judged in the heavenly court. It is not for you to judge what I did or did not do in the course of my life. I had planned to pay only 100 goldens for my plot. Quite a respectable sum. And that is what I shall pay, not a penny more. I'm not asking for any special location or a fancy gravestone. Bury me wherever you see fit. I have just one request. On my gravestone, I want it to be inscribed, here lies Israel the Goy. They were shocked that he said that. So the members of the society exchanged glances. Was the old man out of his mind? They spent a few more minutes at his bedside, hoping to secure at least a modest sum for the community poor, but finally left his house in exasperation. The entire town was abuzz with this latest show of miserliness by Israel Goy. How low can someone sink? Even at death's door, he's hoarding his wealth, refusing to share his blessings with the needy. Israel's actual funeral was a very sorry affair. It was difficult to even scrape together the needed minion of 10 people to conduct a proper Jewish burial. He was buried off to a side on the outskirts of the cemetery. No eulogies were even held for what could be said of such a man. The following Thursday evening, there was a knock on the door of the chief rabbi of Krakow. In the doorway stood a man who explained that he had nothing no money with which to purchase wine, candles, challah, and food for the Shabbat. So the rabbi gave him a few coins from his private charity fund and wished him a good Shabbat. A few minutes later, there was another knock on the door, someone with a similar request. And then a third person came, and then a fourth and a fifth. Within the hour, no less than 20 families had come to ask for the rabbi's aid to meet their Shabbat expenses. And the rabbi was mystified. Nothing like this had ever happened before in all of his years. Why the sudden plague of poverty? So he called an emergency meeting of the trustees of the community's charity funds, but they couldn't explain the phenomenon either. They too had been deluged with hundreds of requests for aid. In the last few hours, the communal coffers had been virtually emptied. As if on cue, there was another knock on the door. Tell me, asked the rabbi, after handing a few coins to the, this last petitioner, how in the world did you manage? What did you do last week? You know, what's going on? And he said, well, we always could buy on credit at the grocers. And whenever we needed food and did not have money to pay, the merchants just said, it's not a problem. He just wrote it down on a ledger. He didn't even bother us about the payment. We could buy on credit. And he never even asked about the payment. But now he says that arrangement is over. Investigation revealed that hundreds of families in Krakow for years had lived this way. For some reason, none of the grocers, fishmongers, butchers were willing to extend credit any longer to the town's poor. 
So the rabbi called the town's food merchants to his study and demanded to know what was going on. At first they refused, but the rabbi was adamant, you're not leaving this room until you tell me what this is all about. Finally, the truth came out. For years, Israel had supported hundreds of the poorest families in Krakow. Every week, the town's merchants would present the bill to him, and they were paid in full. His only condition was that not a soul, not even their closest family members, should know, because if any one of you breathes a word of this to anyone he threatened, you won't see another penny from me ever again. So the chief rabbi was shattered. Such a special person had lived in their midst, and they, in their haste to judge him, had insulted him. They've reviled him for years, and the rabbi announced that the passing of Israel Goy should now be a public fast day. He had been paying for every family's food and the Shabbat stuff that they needed, and they never knew it was from him. So all adults were to neither eat or drink from morning to evening. Everyone would gather at the cemetery to beg forgiveness from the deceased. The rabbi himself eulogized Israel, and he said, You fulfilled the mitzvah of tzedakah, or charity, in its most perfect form, without taking any credit for the deed and ensuring that no recipient of your generosity should ever stand ashamed before his benefactor or feel indebted to him. And we repaid you with derision and scorn. And the rabbi expressed the wish that when his own time came, he wanted to be buried next to Israel Goy. He said, we, bury, we buried you near the fence like an outcast but I shall consider it a great honor and a privilege to be buried next to you. The rabbi also instructed that the rich man's last wish be fulfilled on the marker raised above the grave where etched the words, here lies Israel Goy. However, a word was added to the inscription, the word Kadosh, the Holy One. And so the inscription reads, to this very day on the gravestone adjoining that of the famed rabbi, the old Jewish cemetery of Krakow, here lies Israel Goy Kadosh. But this is why we can't judge people. All too often we judge people uh, and we really have no idea. How many of you know we don't have all the information? And even God, this is why people ask me, well, this person did that or this person did that. Is he going to heaven or to hell? And I say, guess what? That's not my job, okay? That's above my pay grade. I'm to bring everybody in. God is the one who knows the past of every person and why they do what they do. So uh, just like in the parable in the Gospels, it said they brought in all this fish, both the clean and the unclean. Our job is not to clean them. <laughs> Our job is to catch them and bring them in. Uh, I'll, I'll just share this story here because I have a few more minutes. I'll give you a good example. I got saved back in 75, 1975. So I've been saved, what, about 50 years? And there was, I was in one of those big independent uh, Pentecostal uprisings during the 70s. And we had about 600 people back then in our congregation. It was a pretty good size. And I was just a young upstart. I was about 20 years old. Okay, but I had just been through two years of uh, full-time evangelizing. And I don't know how many ever been to Denver before, but uh, I, w we had a place at 909 East Colfax, which is in like the worst area of Denver. Uh, and this is where a lot of the gay people were there. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we did a, a lot of things to reach the lost. Uh, some of them were quite hilarious. But... I had worked with a lot of homosexuals back in the 70s. I know how to work with them. And I go to this church, and nobody knew, but there's this one girl uh, who came to the congregation. Her name was Tony, T-O-N-I, Tony. And Vicky and I had been there for like six months, but we never got to meet Tony because our two kids were babies, so we ran the nursery. And whenever the service is over, the first thing we want to do is have the parents come get their kids, Okay. But uh, one day, there was, I had this one kid left, and I had to go search for the parents. I wanted to get out of there. So I go into the sanctuary. I find the parents' kid, and someone says, hey, I want to introduce you to Tony, T-O-N-Y. And she's been coming for several months now. And I go, hi, Tony. How are you? And we talk. And Tony leaves. And I said, do you know Tony is Tony with a Y, not a Tony with an I. Okay, I knew this was a transsexual. She was, he was a guy 
who dressed as a woman and really looked like a woman, okay? Well, the very next week, Tony comes up to the pulpit and announces to everyone, guess what, I'm really a guy. All right, all the ladies are freaking out, all the men are freaking out, uh, the pastor's freaking out, and I take Tony and a couple of other people to my house every week for years, and uh, I did a discipleship thing, just working with them. And uh, what's amazing about Tony with a Y, because I didn't immediately start on the outside, I started on the inside working out, guess what happened? He ended up taking male hormones, transitioning back to a man. He ended up moving to Mexico, working on the mission field, and he ended up getting married, okay? But the thing is, I wasn't judging him. I was just trying to work from the inside out, and that's what makes all the difference in the world. Uh, matter of fact, many of you may not know, but when we were at CFAN, there was about a 70-year-old woman who came. Well, I knew the 70-year-old woman was a guy. And this is at El Shaddai. And it kind of turns out he was a man, okay, for 50 years, was married, had kids, but he decided later that he wanted to be a woman, and he was a woman for about the last 15 years. And he came, and I talked to him, and then within a couple of weeks, she disappeared, but he came, and no one knew that she had left, and he is now there. They were asking me, where did she go? And I didn't say a word. She was now a he again, back going to the sea fan when we were there, and nobody had a clue. I love working with those people because I know how to reach them. But uh, anyway, with that said, let's cast aside judging one another. We are living in the most phenomenal times in history of this world, and our goal is not to stand in judgment of other people. Our goal is to save them from the tsunami of God's judgment that's coming. Amen? Okay, let's stand.